Hello everybody, today we are looking at Unit 4 Biology Area of Study 2, um, which is focusing on two major components, so DNA manipulation and biological knowledge and society. Today's video is going to focus on DNA manipulation. So first things first, the dot points that we are going to cover in this session, um, we are going to talk about the use of different enzymes, mainly talking about endonucleic Ases, which are restriction enzymes. We're going to talk about ligases and we're going to talk about polymerases. We are then going to talk about the amplification of DNA and how we can make copies of DNA using PCR. We're also going to talk about gel electrophoresis and how this process can help us sort DNA fragments. Um, and we're also going to talk about the interpretation of these gels that are um, produced by a gel electrophoresis. We are then going to talk about the use of recombinant plasmids as vectors that are transforming bacterial cells. All right, so our first topic, looking at our different enzymes. So there's three main enzymes that we are going to be focusing on. The first one over here is what we call endonucleases. Now, endonucleases are what we call restriction enzymes. The main purpose of these is to cut, cut, cut our DNA into smaller segments. All right, so restriction enzymes are cutting our double-stranded DNA into smaller fragments, so they're not just random scissors, okay? Every restriction enzyme is specific and it cuts at a specific base sequence, all right? And these precise locations that they are cutting our DNA sequence at are called recognition sites. Our restriction enzymes can cut our DNA in two main ways. All right, It can create what we call a blunt end or what we call a sticky end. Now, a blunt end, as you can see here, is where it is a sharp cut. Okay, So there is no overhanging region um, that is created. It's just a blunt cut. Whereas our sticky ends are created um, when an enzyme cuts the DNA, but also leaves what we call an overhang region. So it's this kind of um, segment that's sort of um, slipping over the edge of the DNA sequence. Now, sticky ends are really good in that they are able to join um, with a complementary sticky end of another segment of DNA. It makes it a little bit easier for them to join together. All right, in terms of joining together, we're going to talk about ligases. Now, ligases, when you think of them, I want you to think of glue. Now, we know that glue sticks things together. So ligases are enzymes that are catalyzing the joining of different segments of DNA at their sugar phosphate backbone. So the process of us joining two separate parts of DNA together, okay, that process is called ligation or annealing. We're annealing or joining those two segments of DNA together. Now, an example of where this is used is in recombinant um, DNA when we're creating plasmids um, because we are joining DNA that's external into a new strand of DNA. Okay, so over here, this is where our sticky ends kind of become really important because they're going to fit like little building blocks or Lego pieces. Okay, they're going to be able to fit in really well together. Our last enzyme that we're going to talk about is what we call polymerases. Now polymerases are enzymes that are synthesizing DNA or RNA molecules from free nucleotides, okay, so from deoxyribonucleotides or ribonucleotides, depending on whether it's DNA or RNA that's been created. So these enzymes, polymerases, they're going to be essential for DNA and RNA um, to be replicating and they work to create two identical strands from the original DNA or RNA strand that we have. Okay, so there's different um, types of synthesis that can happen. Uh, DNA synthesis is where we are synthesizing or making copies of DNA from an original DNA strand. RNA synthesis is where we're synthesizing RNA from a DNA template strand. And RNA, uh, sorry, reverse transcriptase is where we're making complementary DNA from an mRNA strand. So we're working almost um, backwards. We're doing the opposite of transcription. All right, moving on to our next little bit. We are talking about polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Now PCR is basically the process of amplifying DNA. 
Whenever we talk about amplifying DNA, we're talking about making copies. Now, if we think of being at a crime scene, a lot of the time, there's not going to be a lot of DNA at that crime scene, okay? So when we're doing all of our lab work, we need multiple, multiple, multiple copies to be able to run numerous tests, okay? It's not enough just to do tests off one single DNA strand. So what we do is we make copies, we amplify it. And to do that, we need to follow a specific process. And that process is called PCR. So um, it starts off, all right, by us collecting our target DNA sample that we need, okay? Once we've got our DNA sample, that DNA sample is going to be denatured. Okay, so denaturing, um, we know it can happen when we increase the temperature. And in this case, we're increasing the temperature to 90 to 95 degrees. Okay, this is going to cause our DNA strands to begin to separate. We then at 50 to 55 degrees, um, so we're now cooling the DNA a little bit, um, at this temperature, we are adding primers, and primers are basically short strands of mRNA that are annealed or bonded to our DNA, okay? So they're going to help to start creating our next um, complementary DNA sequence. So in order to do that, we then need to change our temperature to 72 degrees, okay? And that's where a thermally stable DNA polymerase, so an example of a DNA polymerase that we use, is TAC polymerase. This enzyme is going to bind to those primers that were added at the step before, um, and they're going to be added on each side of the exposed DNA strand and be able to synthesize a complementary strand of DNA. Okay, um, this is going to then help us create a new double-stranded DNA um, sequence. So after one cycle has been completed, there are going to now be two copies of our original DNA sample. And I can keep repeating this process again and again, all right, and each time I do it, it's gonna exponentially grow. So I'm gonna start off with one, that's gonna make two, that's gonna make four, that's gonna make eight, that's gonna make 16, and so on. So we can, in a short amount of time, create quite a few copies of our original DNA sequence. Now this over here is again a, just another diagram to show you what's going on. So step one, we've denatured our DNA um, to separate the strands, so that's at 90 to 95 degrees. We've then added our primers at 50 to 55 degrees. And then at 72 degrees, we have added our DNA polymerase, which is gonna help create that complementary strand. And again, if that process is repeated, we're gonna end up with lots and lots of our um, copies that we need. Moving on to the next part. Okay, so this next part that we are looking at is gel electrophoresis. Now gel electrophoresis is a process that we're using to separate DNA strands based on two major things, okay? Those things being their size and their electric charge. Now with DNA, we know that DNA is negatively charged, okay? And it's negatively charged because of that phosphate. Okay, those of you that study chemistry will know that phosphate is PO4 negative. Okay, so it's that negative charge that is in DNA. And we know that anything negative is going to be attracted to a positive end. Now that's going to make sense in a second. So in terms of preparing our DNA for gel electrophoresis, we need to make sure that that DNA has been cut into smaller pieces. Okay, and like we talked about before, those restriction enzymes our little scissors are what are cutting the DNA into those smaller fragments for us. And this is going to produce a range of DNA at different lengths. So now what the process is going to be is to separate those DNA fragments so we can try to figure out who they belong to, what they are, and anything that we might need for an investigation. So what we do is our gel electrophoresis is basically a machine that we apply an electric field to to the solution, okay? So we load up our DNA in these wells, okay? And they are probably our unknowns. We don't know um, what they are, but we might have two things or three things that we know what they are that we can compare against. So like I said, DNA is negatively charged and it's gonna be attracted to the positive terminal. So when we turn this machine on, our DNA is gonna be traveling from this side all the way down to this side, to the positive electrode, okay? 
This can be also visualised by applying dyes and radio labelled probes to our DNA to make things a little bit clearer to see. But basically our fragments are going to separate and they're going to separate based on size. So smaller fragments are going to be able to travel a lot quicker through the gel okay, than our larger fragments. If you think of people in a room, if you're one person and you're starting at the front of the room and you want to run all the way to the end, there's a whole lot of obstacles in the way. Is it going to be easier for one person to get through or is it going to be easier for like a huge chain of people if you're all interconnected to get through? Probably that one person. Okay, so the same, those smaller fragments are going to travel um, quicker through the gel and further. So this can be seen over here where we've got BP representing base pairs of DNA. If this was our starting point, as we go down the gel, all right, the smaller fragments have been able to move further down. We also have what we call a molecular ladder, which is basically DNA sequences of known lengths that we can use to compare um, our unknown samples of DNA to, to try to figure out what they are. So they could be um, along the along one end of our of our gel. Um, we also often have a negative control as well, which is going to help us check for contamination. Okay, so it's a sample that's run without any DNA to make sure that the only thing that is actually moving through our gel is DNA. Alrighty, moving on. All right, so the final component for this set of dot points that we're looking at is called recombinant plasmids. Now. The use of recombinant plasmids are in this study design being talked about as vectors to transform bacterial cells. So we're going to start off by talking about a vector. Now a vector is a self-replicating DNA molecule, okay, it's usually a plasmid or viral DNA that can be used to transmit a gene from one organism into another, okay, so we're basically taking something from one thing and putting it into another thing. So plasmids are accessory chromosomes that occur naturally, usually in bacteria, and we know that bacteria have circular DNA, okay? Um, and there are simical chemical treatments, simple chemical treatments that can allow um, cells and some bacterial cells that do not naturally transfer DNA to now be able to take up that external or extra DNA. Um, so examples that this is used in is antibiotic resistance genes, poison resistance genes, um, plasmids, um, where we're producing proteins in order to kill other bacteria. So fragments of DNA we know are going to be joined together through DNA ligase, where we're going to produce a molecule of recombinant DNA. So the process that is happening is over here. All right, so what I have got is I have got my plasmid vector, okay? I've got a recognition site which my restriction enzyme is, know, is going to know that it needs to cut there. And that recognition site is going to be the same as my gene of interest, okay, which is my foreign DNA. So I'm going to take that out and we're going to pop it into this um, plasmid, all right? So that's going to join and that's going to join with DNA ligase, okay? And we have now created what we call a recombinant vector, which carries our gene of interest. Now the thing with this plasmid vector in particular is it has an antibiotic resistance gene. So we know that if bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, okay, so if bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, the bacteria will be destroyed, okay. But if a bacteria is resistant to an antibiotic, that means the bacteria is still going to be able to grow on an agar plate with the antibiotic there. So what we do is we can use antibiotic resistance genes as a way for us to see whether a plasmid has taken up our gene of interest. So if a plasmid has taken up our gene of interest, okay, um, the resistance gene along with it, the bacteria will then grow. So we know that we have created a plasmid that works. If the plasmid has not taken up the resistance gene, the bacteria are not going to be able to grow. Okay, so that means that we have failed in creating that recombinant plasmid. And that means that won't also have the gene of interest that we wanted. Hopefully our first dot point now makes a little bit more sense. Obviously we haven't gone into extreme details. This is more of a summary.
But if you have any questions, leave them below. Bye.